All right, y'all. So we're gonna be watching a complete guide to being a jungler, man. Now this is actually my main role. So let's see if we can learn something, something that we don't know, a few tricks and stuff. Let me know in the comment section if you actually see something in this video that's helpful and something that you did not know about the jungle role, man. Let's jump into it, y'all. The jungler is probably the most challenging role to play in Mobile Legends, apart from being responsible for securing important objectives. Most challenging? I don't know. I, I would say that that's the tank. I would say the tank role is the most challenging. But anyway. Most challenging role to play in Mobile Or Rome. Rome. Rome is most challenging. Mobile Legends. Apart from being responsible for securing important objectives, the jungler has to manage farming, protect his jungle from invaders, and still find time to support his team with ganks. So in this video, I will be revealing to you clear and easy strategies that even someone new to the role can apply, including what you should be doing at different stages of the game so that you can become an effective and game-winning jungler. So what exactly is a jungler in Mobile Legends? Well, a jungler is basically the player in a team with the Retribution Battle spell. When a player has the Retribution spell, he is restricted to only farming the jungle during the first five minutes of the game. This is due to the fact that he will receive reduced gold in experience when he farms lane minions during the first five minutes. This makes the jungler unique, as he is rarely present in the lanes compared to the four other roles. To compensate for this, the jungler is awarded bonuses when farming the jungle during the first five minutes of the game. This is why it is important for you to understand the bonuses you have when you equip Retribution. Having the Retribution spell provides you with four passive effects. The first effect grants you 60% extra rewards when you kill jungle monsters, which basically means you gain bonus gold and experience compared to other heroes without retribution when farming jungle monsters. The second effect reduces the damage you take from basic monsters by 40%. Basic monsters are simply any jungle monster that is not the turtle or lord. The third effect is only active for the first two minutes of the game and will further reduce the damage taken from jungle monsters on your own side of the map by an additional 15%. This means you will have a 55% damage reduction from monsters in your own jungle during the first two minutes. In exchange for these bonus effects on jungle monsters during the first five minutes of the game, the jungler will only receive 50% of rewards from minions in lane if no other teammates are nearby. If teammates are nearby, the jungler will not receive any minion rewards in lanes. Basically, this means that you should avoid being in lanes and killing enemy minions. The only time you should be doing this is if you're passing by and want to help your teammate clear their minion wave faster, or if your ally was just killed and the waves are already pushing the turret. These four effects are granted regardless of the number of retribution stacks you have. Now wait, what are retribution stacks? Basically, all junglers will start the game with zero retribution stacks and will be at stage one of retribution. Each time you slay a jungle monster, you will gain one retribution stack. Each Retribution stack does not give additional bonuses by themselves, but will award bonuses when you unlock the next stage by getting the necessary amount of stacks. Stage 2 of Retribution unlocks at 5 Retribution stacks. At Stage 2, your Retribution spell damage will be increased by 50%. Furthermore, you will also unlock the Retribution blessing that you have chosen when you bought your jungling boots at the start of the game. The Chosen blessing has different effects when cast on an enemy hero. The options are Ice Retribution, which slows the target hero and also speeds yourself up when cast for 4 seconds. Flame Retribution, which reduces a target hero's physical attack and magic power while increasing your own for 4 seconds. And Bloody Retribution, which deals burning damage to the target hero for 4 seconds. For beginners, I will generally just recommend Ice Retribution, since it's the easiest to gain the maximum benefit from its effect. It is useful for escaping and also for chasing enemies down. Flame Retribution is mostly useful to heroes who rely on bursting the enemy, as it can increase their damage by stealing the enemy's damage stats for a short time window. Bloody Retribution's damage scales with your own extra HP stats, so it's most optimized for tank junglers who have plenty of HP items to increase the damage of this spell. At 15 Retribution stacks, you will achieve Stage 3 of Retribution, which simply gives you a bonus of 10 physical attack and magic power, and also 100 additional HP. Although the numbers are pretty small, which means it isn't too important to remember this, it's still something extra and nice to have. It is yeah. important to know that you should have the jungling boots as part of your items throughout the game. If you do not have or sell the boots, you will lose the 50% damage increase to your retribution spell, which puts you at a great disadvantage when trying to secure objectives. You will also mm. lose the blessing effect, such as ice retribution, if you do not have jungling boots. Furthermore, having jungling boots grants you a passive that deals extra true damage to jungle monsters, which helps you to clear jungle monsters much faster. 
This is why junglers must always have boots as part of their items all throughout the game. You should also know that Retribution has a 35 seconds cooldown, so it is crucial that you optimize how you use it. I will cover Retribution usage in more detail later on in the guide, so stay tuned. So why is it important to have a jungler in the team? Well, essentially, having a jungler in a team will help to maximize resource efficiency in the team. In Mobile Legends, the map is split into three lanes. A team can gain resources by farming lane minions. However, the amount of resources given to each lane are fixed, and there are five players in each team to split these resources to. If all five players are in the lanes, the lane resources will have to be divided amongst all five of them. This would be efficient if there were no other resources to gain elsewhere. But in between the three lanes exists the jungle area. These areas contain jungle monsters which are neutral resources that can be slain by any player on either team for EXP and gold. If a player on the team can focus on farming these areas instead, lane resources can then be split to four players, which increases their share of EXP and gold. Normally there will also be a roamer, which allows the split to be among three players. As explained earlier, a jungler with retribution will have bonuses when farming in the jungle, which helps him farm these monsters efficiently. This makes it very resource efficient to have a jungler in any team. Not having a jungler in a team basically handicaps that team in terms of resource gain, especially during the early and mid game. Huge. Now that we know the importance of having a jungler in the team, let's highlight what a jungler is supposed to do. While there is a large variety of heroes that can play the jungler role, the main responsibilities of any jungler remain the same. Number one, the jungler is in charge of securing major neutral objectives, which are the turtle and lord. The Retribution spell has instant and high burst damage to jungle monsters, including the Turtle and Lord, which is why the jungler is crucial when it comes to securing these objectives. Getting the Turtle or Lord are important to winning games, as they provide rewards to your entire team when secured. This is a special... See, now when you start to play at a higher level, this isn't always so set in stone. Because really, it's really just about securing object. The game in general is about securing objectives. So yeah, you can secure objectives like Lord and Turtle and things like that, but you can also bait them and use them because you know that the enemy team is going to go for them. You can not go for them and then push two towers in one lane, which obviously gets you closer to the win. So yeah, the enemy team just got a boost, a boost in their stats a little bit if they secure Turtle. But really, did they? Because for that turtle, they lost two towers. And then if you could like push multiple lanes at the same time and maybe take more than two towers, then obviously it wasn't a win for them to go for turtle. So if you're going to lose an objective like turtle or something like that, like you're underfed, you can't fight the enemy team or something like that, sometimes it makes more sense to go for a different objective and let the enemies have the turtle that way you can try to come back by securing another objective. So, yeah, that's, um, it's just a higher level of thinking, but this is like a basic guide, it seems like. This is a, you know, this is a pretty, this seems like a pretty simple fundamental part of, part of the um, video right now. So, yeah, I mean, just wanted to clarify that it does change. It does get a lot more complex than this, but this is a good just starting point for you to keep in your head. Especially true for the Lord, as it will spawn stronger minions in all lanes which gives your team stronger pushing power to help take down enemy turrets. Number 2. The jungler is in charge of farming his own jungle, and if possible deny the enemy's jungle. As jungle monsters are all neutral resources, meaning it is available to both allies and enemies to farm, the jungler is in a race against the opposing jungler to grab as much off the map as possible throughout the game, especially during the early to mid phases. Ensuring your own jungle monsters are cleared means that the enemies will not have access to those resources. The effect is doubled if you steal away their monsters, as not only are you gaining farm, but are also denying it away from the enemy. Number right. three, the jungler is in charge of rotating to the lanes to assist his team with ganks. Since the jungler is not restricted to farming lane minions, he is able to move around the map while clearing his jungle. This gives the jungler access to all three lanes, which provides opportunities for ganking. Ganking enemies will help to increase pressure on the enemies, giving the advantage to the allies that you helped in that lane, or at least relieve some pressure on them if they were losing. Actually, most players would already know these three things, but it's balancing all three tasks and doing the right thing at the right time that makes jungling the most difficult role to play. Don't worry though, I will try to give you as much information I can throughout this guide to help you with this. Yeah, it is difficult to balance everything, and also... When it comes down to balancing everything and how you want to be moving, how you want to be rotating, what parts of the jungle you're going to be in, when you're going to be invading to try to steal your enemy jungle, 
it has everything to do with how your team is playing as well. And if you're a solo player, that completely changes because then there's no strategy. It's just the wild, wild west. You got to try to go for whatever is there. You got to push towers. You got to do everything. As opposed to if you're playing with a team, there's going to be set rotations that you all are doing. You all are going to be meeting up together to fight or meeting up together to go for objectives and things like that. So it gets very, very complicated. It definitely gets complicated, like the, the depending on what you're doing, if you're playing solo versus if you're actually playing with a full um team so yeah or if you're playing trio it even changes then because yeah i mean it it, it, it just definitely is a complicated role definitely is a complicated role now there are primarily two categories of junglers that sit on opposite ends in terms of what they can do the first are the damage junglers damage junglers are usually heroes whose damage scales well with resources typically assassins are favored in this role due to their high mobility such as ling hayabusa nolan and fanny However, you can also play non-assassin heroes as damage junglers, such as Granger, Lunox, and Dyroth. Damage junglers are highly valued for their strong damage output, which gives them great snowball potential. However, as they are not so durable, they can be prone to early game invades by enemies who are aware of this. They also tend to find it more difficult in the later phases of a game when teams start to group up more, as damage junglers are squishy and can be bursted quite easily. Usually, assassins are picked more often as damage junglers due to their high mobility, they can usually rotate quicker compared to most other heroes. This allows them to split push very effectively, present a solo kill threat, and also steal objectives when necessary. The second category of junglers are the utility junglers. They are typically tank or fighter heroes that provide plenty of utility to their team, as their name suggests. Examples of utility junglers are Akai, Fredrin, Barats, and Grok. These types of junglers are valued for their ability to provide support for their team, and also for their control over the neutral objective area during contests. However, because they usually don't have high damage scaling, they are more reliant on their team when it comes to dealing damage. Despite the fact that I have laid out two clear categories, there are heroes that lie in between these two types. A great example is Mardis, who usually starts off as a damage jungler during the early to mid phases of the game, but can transition into a damage utility hybrid by the end of the game by going with a defensive build. Guinevere is another example who has great early game scaling and can be classed as a damage jungler, but can also run a defensive build and make use of her excellent crowd control abilities to become a damage utility hybrid. There's not really a best type of jungler, as all of them are really effective in what they do. So the best one will be the hero that fits in with the team composition. The most important thing to understand is what... And it was also best is the one that you know how to play well. Like, don't force yourself to play certain jungle junglers that's not for you. If you want to be on the jungle road, like for me, my, my best jungler, I can play any jungler, like assassins and stuff like that, but I, I don't play with strong teams, so it's harder to play assassins because I'm not good enough on assassins to stay alive without some level of support. I can't take on four people by myself with assassins. While you have somebody, some people like Kyrie, who maybe he can take on four people because he's just that good on assassins. So me personally, I have to go more so towards utility jungles like alpha or or hybrid jungles. Like I, I play more hi hybrids like hi alpha, where I can sustain and tank for myself, but I can also do a lot of damage. So. It's like I, I get the best of both worlds, so I don't have to depend on my team actually being good. Like, I get in situations where I can't trust my team, so that's how I prefer to jungle, where I can take care of myself. So, I mean, it, it's really up to you. Like, I know a lot of people try to play assassins because it looks cool, but what's a lot more cool than looking cool is actually being able to win the game, you know? So, yeah. What your role in the team really is, and who your team's carry is. For example... Picking up a tank jungler like Akai or Barats means that you're not the team's carry, and your role is to provide support so that resources can be allocated to your team's damage dealers. However, if you pick up an assassin like Ling or Nolan, you are the team's carry and you will need to focus on getting as much resources so you can carry the team. Therefore, picking up the right type of jungler for the right type of situation is crucial. If your team already has a Freya EXP and Beatrix Gold Lane, picking up a hero like Nolan isn't as effective as something like a Fredrin or a Kai who can help the damage dealer's front line and peel. I would recommend to beginners that you should start by mastering one hero first and make sure you understand that hero deeply. You should try to understand your hero's strengths and weaknesses very well, such as their counters, their power spikes, and their best item combinations. Once yep. you have mastered one hero, you can move on to more heroes and expand your hero pool. I would recommend at least mastering two heroes for each type of jungler, 
so that you are able to adjust and react to any draft. As you expand your hero pool, you should keep up to date with the meta and learn which heroes are stronger. While most heroes will work in lower ranks, certain heroes have more weaknesses or are easily countered, and will eventually face difficulties in higher ranks when enemies are more knowledgeable in the game and know how to counter. Using a hero that is harder to counter and stronger will usually give you better results if your aim is to gain ranks. I will be trying to cover what's meta in Mobile Legends as often as I can, so make sure to subscribe to my channel if you want to pick up the strongest heroes. Now we have the fundamental concepts out of the way, let's start with how we play the early game. The early game phase begins right from the start of the draft until around the 5 minutes mark of the game. The draft is highly important as this is the point where we can already start planning what we're going to do, especially in the first 2 minutes of the game. We can use the little map here at the bottom right of the screen to check out what the positions of things are for that particular game. What we want to note is the position of the EXP in gold lanes. Remember, the first turtle will always spawn on the side of the EXP lane. This is because we want to have an idea of which lane we'd like to path to and gank first. The first ganking lane is what every jungler should think of before a game starts. This will affect how you will rotate in the jungle for the first two minutes of the game. The average jungler will default to just ganking gold lane, because that's what they've seen most other junglers do. But I'd like you to think more deeply about this. The choice of which lane to path to can be a very complex choice, as many factors play into- Personally, I gank to the gold lane, not because it's what other people do. I gank to the gold lane because most games go into the late game, especially when you play against good players. So you want your gold laner to be more fair as possible and the enemy gold laner to be the least fair. And also the solo laner is supposed to really be a strong enough player so they can win their lane without needing the assistance. They can handle being ganked. They can handle staying alive if the enemy team attempts to gank them. So if you go and you dominate the other team's gold laner, later on throughout that game, they're not going to have any damage because that player is now useless because they got ganked all game. So that's that's really why I get my gold laner fed and I kill the other gold laner. But, I mean, it, it really does come down to your strategy. I mean, some, some games you could carry just by going to the EXP lane and carrying with the help of the EXP laner if, if he's strong enough. So, I mean, it, it's, multiple, it, it's multiple different ways to go about it. So what makes the right decision? Now, these are some of the fundamental questions that I ask myself while making that decision when I'm playing jungle. The first question is whether to gank gold or EXP lane first. Whichever lane you gank first will help to give your ally more lane control over the opposing laner. Gold laners are typically heroes that are weak early, but have high damage scaling with farm. So the main advantage of helping your gold laner gain lane control is to help them scale faster, while slowing the enemy's gold laner down. It can be very scary if a gold laner gets fed early, as that can be an unstoppable snowball in the hands of a solid gold lane player. However, the EXP lane is actually a great lane to gank first. EXP laners tend to be heroes that perform best in the early to mid phases. By allowing them to gain lane control, you can free them from laning responsibilities and assist your team with other tasks, such as invading or team fighting for objectives. As the first turtle always spawns at the EXP lane, both teams' EXP laners play a huge part in the first turtle contest. Successfully ganking that lane first means that your team will gain a huge advantage over the turtle contest and could start the snowball for your team. And one thing that I've noticed from playing with my own team is that my team struggles to support uh, during taking objectives and stuff like that. So the enemy team can just freely all dive on me because of the positioning. I don't know whose position. I don't know if it's the heroes that, that my team plays and stuff like that. So it's not really valuable to us going for objectives. When we go to objectives, we're more likely to lose the game. So when we go for like turtle contests and stuff like that, it's not, it never really ends well because even if we secure the objective, people get wiped and it's just, it doesn't really benefit us. So we, we really default to going for the gold lane towers and taking the gold lane out. And that's really the trade-off. So we sacrifice needing to get the EXP laner, you know, get free him up. That way he can just stay one in his lane. He doesn't have to help us at turtle or anything. And we can just go win the game through the gold lane because most of our games go late anyway. Also because of how the team tends to play the game. So, I mean, it's just you have to adapt to your team, your, strat your team strategies and how they play. That's really what you got to do. You have to adapt. Like when I play solos with randoms, like going for jungles, going for like turtle and stuff like that, it's not very common unless I can tell instantly my players are good, then it may be worth it. But nah, I, I don't do that with randoms because I don't, I can't trust my own team to protect me. No way I'm going to be trusting randoms to do it. So 
it's, it is really about decision making and being able to make the right decisions that, that makes the most sense for your current situation. The next question to ask is which buff is more important? Currently, buffs stay active for 75 seconds after you slay the buff monster, which usually means only the second buff that you take will still be active for the first turtle contest. For example, if you start with orange and do purple second, you will only have the purple buff still active during the first turtle fight. This is important, especially for mana-hungry and energy-hungry heroes who require the purple buff to keep fighting. Examples of such heroes are Ling, Fanny, Alice, or Roger, who are reliant on the purple buff to sustain their mana or energy-hungry kits. However, if your strategy is to gank or invade at level 2 with such heroes, you can even take the purple buff early to do this to great effect. I know plenty of Fanny players that take purple first so they can invade the enemy jungle at level 2. Heroes that are not purple buff reliant may find it more advantageous to keep the orange buff active for the first turtle fight, as the orange buff provides extra damage and slow effects to their attacks. This is very effective, especially for melee heroes that can use the slow effect to maintain their range on enemies. The third question I ask myself is which lane is the easiest to gank? While the gold lane seems like an obvious answer for most people, since the gold laner is usually a squishy marksman hero, I'd ask you to think a little more about this. While it is true that most gold laners are easier to kill squishy targets compared to EXP laners, this may not always lead to a successful gank. At least in the current meta, there has always been heavy attention placed on the gold lane, which means that the enemy roamer will most likely be there to protect his gold laner, and the enemy mid laner also tends to rotate there. Furthermore, smart gold laners, especially those who have watched my gold lane guide, will know how to position safely and be expecting your gank. This makes the seemingly easy task to gank gold lane not that easy at all. On the other hand, EXP laners are usually melee heroes and will have to walk up to lane minions to farm for the most part, and EXP lane players also tend to be more aggressive in their approach. This typically leads to them trading HP often and having lower health by the time you rotate to their lane. This usually allows for an easier ganking opportunity compared to the gold lane. Make sure to take note of what battle spells both of these laners take during the loading screen. This will also affect how easy that lane can be ganked. For example, if you're playing Guinevere Jungle and the gold laner has Inspire, while the EXP laner has Purify, it is likely that you'll find the gold laner easier to gank. Since Guinevere relies on her crowd control to be successful in her gank, Purify on the EXP laner is an easy counter to your kit, while the gold laner will most likely die if you land your skills. There are a million more factors that can affect what makes the right lane to gank first, but these are three factors that I believe are enough consideration for you to pick your early path. In my opinion, it's usually best to gank the lane where you will have the best chance of success, whether or not it's gold or EXP. Snowballing is really important in Mobile Legends, and I find it's the best way to increase our chances of winning. If you're experienced enough, you should also identify invade potential during the drafting phase. Negative invade potential means that your team lineup is prone to being invaded, while positive invade potential means your team has a strong invading lineup. When it comes to the early phases, the roamers and mid laners are usually the ones to help to protect or invade the jungle. Sometimes the EXP laners may get involved, but this is less common in solo queue and lower ranks, where EXP laners tend to just stick to their lanes, so make sure to pay extra attention to the roamer mid lane and jungle picks during the draft. For example, suppose you're playing Alice as a jungler and your team picks Sicilian as the mid laner and Natalia as the roamer. Now imagine the enemy team is playing Barats as the jungler, Valir as the mid laner, and Tigril as the roamer. This is a case of huge negative invade potential. Alice only unlocks her full kit at level 4, while Sicilian is a hero who only excels after he gets enough farm and stacks. Natalia is not built to defend against invaders and works better as an invader herself. Meanwhile, the enemy has three really strong early game heroes who can easily invade your jungle. When your team has negative invade potential, you should prepare your team to defend your jungle in the early game by signaling for help, and hopefully they will help you out when the enemy invades. Otherwise, you will just have to try and do your best to find farm elsewhere. Honestly, with the setup he just showed, I would focus on counter invades, because if that enemy team wants to invade you, they're going to invade you, and there's nothing that you can do. Like he pointed out, Natalia can do nothing. So Natalia can be there, and would still be useless in trying to stop and invade. So, yeah, you're better off just trying to counter invade the enemy at that point. Some games are simply a lost cause due to poor drafting such as this, as the early game invading snowball may be too difficult to overcome. This is hard to prevent in solo queue, but much easier to do when you're playing in a squad. On the flip side, if your team's draft is good for invading, you should try to use signals or inform your teammates early of your intentions so they can prepare. Once the game starts, you immediately should start with your jungle path. 
Optimal jungle clear paths vary from patch to patch, so I will not cover it here in detail. Instead, I have covered these paths in another video which I have listed in the description of this video below. So check it out if you want to know the latest optimal paths. There's a question that I think most beginner or even advanced junglers have, which is, when should I use my retribution spell? If you've watched professional games, such as the most recent M5 World Championship, some junglers even use their retribution as soon as they start the first jungle buff, while some save it until the buff is dying. Well, the answer will depend on how likely you are to be invaded, and whether you are able to secure the buff without retribution, even if you are invaded. You should only cast your retribution early if you're very confident to secure the buff even if you're invaded, or you're confident that the enemy will not invade. The advantage of casting retribution early is to boost your clearing speed. Since retribution has a relatively medium length cooldown, using it early means you can spam it more often, thus allowing you to clear and rotate faster for ganks. Reaching the lanes earlier than the enemy jungler can be the difference between a good early game or a bad one. The disadvantage of this is that you will not have it available to secure the jungle monster if you're invaded. If you're a beginner, it's usually better to just save it for securing, as losing the buff monster will put you at a gigantic disadvantage that will be very difficult to overcome. Losing any of the first two buff monsters can cause the enemy to start a giant snowball, which can be very difficult to come back from, especially when you're inexperienced, so ensuring you secure the buffs is vital. The next thing you need to understand is hero power spikes. Almost every hero is built differently, so they are stronger when they hit certain spikes. Heroes such as Jawhead or Tammuz are super strong at level 1 and can already gank or invade at that stage, while Julian already unlocks his full kit at level 3 and is ready to wreak havoc at that point. Fanny and Nolan are heroes that are able to cause chaos at level 2, while Alice and Hanzo are really ultimate dependent, and so they will need level 4 to become really effective. Knowing when heroes are strong helps you decide whether you should path safer to farm towards your power spike, or abuse your early spike and go for an early gank or invade. Similarly, you can use this to gauge how strong the enemies are, and whether you should play more defensively or offensively. While you're farming in the jungle, make it a habit to keep watching the minimap. There are a lot of things you can tell just by watching the minimap, especially when your roamer is doing a good job providing vision. Every hero will have a HP bar attached to their hero icon, so keeping an eye for everyone's HP is a good way to decide the location of a good ganking or invade opportunity. For example here, we can see on the mini-map that Irithel is low HP at top lane, and our Kufra is already in position to gank her. I didn't approach her earlier because I was expecting her to retreat, but since I kept watch on the mini-map and saw that she stayed, it gave us an easy kill. A way of forming this habit is to train yourself to look at the mini-map every time you do a basic attack. So basic attack, mini-map, basic attack, mini-map, basic attack, mini-map. This will improve your map awareness, and I would argue that being aware of what's going on around in the map is 90% of a jungler's game. So yeah, exactly. Like, most times, like, you don't have to be looking at your... You don't have to be looking at what you're hitting to basic attack. Because you could just stare at the minimap the whole time, to be honest. Because even if somebody tries to invade you or something, it's, they're going to show up on the minimap. So if you're looking at the minimap, you're still going to see them. So, yeah, it's like looking at the minimap gives you way more information. Make sure to do this if you're a beginner and want to improve as a jungler. Since we've already talked about where and who to gank, I'd like to talk about how to gank next. There are a couple of things you should note as you approach a lane. Firstly, you should note where all the enemies are and how much HP they have, especially the enemies closest to that lane. If you've been watching the map constantly, you would already have this information at the back of your mind. The less enemies are present during a gank, and the lower their HP, the higher the chance that your gank will be successful. Next is how you approach the enemy for a gank. Bushes are your friend, and trying to remain out of vision of the enemy until you engage will give you the element of surprise in a gank. If the enemy is not in a good position for you to engage yet, remaining hidden in a bush until the right time will give you the best chance of success. When you move in for a gank, try not to approach the enemy from the front or from the same position as your teammate in the lane. You should do your best to cut off their escape route so that they will have to at least go through you before they can reach their turrets. For example, here I approached the enemies from the side so they were not able to retreat to the safety of their turret when I engaged them. If I approached them from the front, they would have likely escaped. You can also improve your chances of a gank by keeping a mental note of any escape tools that have been used by enemies. Sometimes your teammates may say something like MMNF in chat. This is short for Marksman No Flicker, which means the enemy marksmen just use flicker. This can also be replaced by NU or NP for No Ultimate or No Purify respectively. It can also be quite obvious that an enemy has used flicker by just watching the minimap, especially if that enemy does not have any natural dashes. 
Flicker is a really common spell that many heroes use and has a 120 seconds cooldown, so taking note of whether enemies have used this is really helpful. When it's around the 1 minute 40 seconds mark, it's best to save your retribution as the first turtle will be spawning at 2 minutes. Dang. At this point, you should already be planning whether you want to be contesting for it. Things that you will mainly need to consider are the number of players that may participate at the turtle contest, the current tempo of the game, and the level gap between you and the enemy jungler. If you've been keeping your eyes on the map, you should be able to estimate how many players will be going to contest for the turtle. If you see that your team is not ready to contest the objective and you're going in with a huge numbers disadvantage, such as a 2v4 or a 1v3, it's better that you just let the objective go and farm elsewhere instead. You will likely not be able to secure that objective and will die in the process of doing so, giving the enemy two advantages instead of just one. The only time you should even try to contest it in a disadvantaged situation is if you're using a mobile hero, such as Hayabusa or Ling, who are able to enter the objective area, cast their retribution for the steal, and get out safely. Another thing you should consider is the current tempo of the game. Tempo is basically whether your team is ahead or behind in terms of fighting potential. For example, if your entire team is level 4 when they arrive for the turtle contest, while the enemy team is still level 3 and without their ultimate, you will have a good chance to completely beat the enemy down if they try and contest for the turtle. However, if instead your team is behind on tempo, it is probably a good idea to retreat, or at least try to regain tempo first before contesting for objectives. As mentioned earlier, a jungler's hero level will determine how much damage their retribution does. Being at the same level means that if it comes down to a retribution battle, it's a 50-50 on who secures it, as both junglers will have the same damage on their retribution. A retribution battle is basically when both junglers are available to use their retribution on the objective when it is at critical HP. So keep an eye on the enemy jungler's level to see if you have any advantage or disadvantage. A tip to increase your success rate on securing objectives is to use this red line as a guide, or use the damage number shown on your retribution spell to gauge when to cast it. The red line basically indicates the damage that your retribution spell does to the objective, and will be shown on both the turtle and lord, as well as the orange and purple buffs. The best way to secure an objective is to pair retribution with your highest damage skill. For example, while playing Lancelot, you can use skill 2 in combination with retribution for a sudden output of burst damage which is really difficult for the enemy jungler to react to. If you're playing Barats, you can use his first skill to combo with Retribution for the same effect. One thing I must say though is that losing a turtle is not really game-changing. It gives some small buffs to you and your team, while rewarding a bit of gold too. But it doesn't really do too much besides that, so it is never worth trying to sacrifice yourself just to get a turtle. You can easily find a trade to gain those resources back. Trading is an essential concept to jungle gameplay. Basically, you are finding something else of near equal value to exchange for whatever the enemy team is getting. For ex Exactly, like taking two towers during that, like it's not even a fair exchange because now the enemy team is behind because they got turtle and you got two towers. Like it's it's just, I would go, that's why I prioritize the objectives that matter. I, I don't ever go for those. Cause it's like it's risky especially fighting with with teammates that you may not necessarily trust to have your back so yeah example if you are able to kill an enemy or two when the enemy takes the turtle it is a really good trade in exchange for that pushing yep. down a turret is considered a good trade as well you can also opt to steal the enemy's buff in exchange though that could be considered a losing trade in most cases however a trade is still better than nothing you can apply the trading concept to anything else in the game if the enemy invades your purple you can trade it with his purple or a kill on his teammate elsewhere on the map. If the enemy is taking turtle and you're not able to reach it in time, try to gank the opposite lane instead or steal away his buff. Basically, you want to be as far ahead on resources as possible in the game of Mobile Legends, so you have to try to take something away from the enemy when they take something away from you. In any case, you're the jungler and you have to decide for your team whether or not to contest an objective. If you do not want to contest, signal to retreat from the objective. On the other hand, signal your intention to contest if you want to. Whether your team listens to you or not is another matter altogether, but at least try to communicate and hope that they listen. While contesting for the objective, make sure to try and keep your HP as high as possible and watch for important enemies that have skills that can stun and lock you down, such as Akaja or Vexana. I can assure you that at higher ranks, you will be heavily focused during these objective contests, especially when the objective HP is approaching critical. Enemies will be doing their best to stop you from casting your retribution, so try your best to play around that and keep yourself healthy so you can secure the objective. Also, try not to rush the objective if you're unsure that you're able to get it. 
Sometimes it's better to delay the objective and use it as a bait to pull the enemy in for a fight, especially if your team is ahead on tempo. Many times, it's better to focus on fighting the enemies first before really going for the objective. This can be applied to both turtles and lord fights. After the first turtle contest is over, it's pretty much back to basics. You should first watch the map and the surroundings to try to gauge where your enemies may be going. This is a crucial time, especially if the enemies have better tempo and are still healthy. Since they've yeah. gathered at the turtle, they may try to invade your jungle, so make sure you're prepared for this. Each turtle spawns exactly two minutes after the previous turtle has been cleared, so it's mostly back to farming and ganking in this brief time window. You can go back to full clearing your jungle and look for ganks or invades when an opportunity arises. The mid phase usually begins around the time the second turtle has been cleared, which is around the five minute mark. Mid phase gameplay is usually when teams start gathering up more for big team fights as first tier turrets start going down and the map starts to open up a little more. The jungler's gameplay approach throughout most of the game from early to late is pretty similar. It will mostly be trying to find a balance between farming, ganking, invading, and securing major neutral objectives. You should apply the strategies and tips that I've already mentioned earlier and use them throughout the game. This is regardless of whatever type of jungler you're playing, as these are the primary responsibilities of playing the jungler role. However, beginning from the fifth minute mark, junglers can also start gaining maximum rewards from lane minions, so you can also start to farm any empty lanes that your teammates are not clearing and are far away from. This will help to manage lane pressure and keep your turrets healthy, which will prevent pushes. An important tip you should also note is that the first Lord spawn is at the 8th minute mark. This 8th minute Lord spawn, however, can be delayed if a turtle was cleared between the 6th to 8th minute, since there is a 2 minute respawn timer after a turtle is cleared. For example, if any team clears the turtle at exactly the 7th minute, the first Lord will only spawn in the 9th minute, 2 minutes after the last turtle was cleared. This timer can be used to your advantage if your team has a massive tempo lead. By controlling and not clearing the last turtle if it's already close to the 8th minute, you can allow the first Lord to spawn early and use it to up the tempo even more. Securing the Lord instead of the turtle will help your team in pushing enemy turrets as it will spawn super minions in each lane and also summon an ally Lord in the weakest enemy lane. The Lord is a crucial objective to secure as compared to the turtle. This is due to how much resources it can help you and your team to gain, which is why it will be difficult to find a balanced trade when you're unable to secure it. The approach yep. to a Lord fight can be quite different for the type of jungler and hero you're playing. In an even Lord contest, a damaged jungler such as Hayabusa or Granger should not be tanking Lord Aggro and holding the Lord for the most part. The Lord can and will do a huge amount of damage to the hero tanking the aggro, or any heroes near it when it does its swinging attack. As such, a damaged jungler should mostly be positioning himself close to the Lord, but not too close that you will take too much damage. This is so you can rush out to do a retribution secure when the Lord is critical, or be able to take part in a team fight when necessary. The key thing here will be to keep your HP high so you are available to secure the objective when the time comes. A utility jungler on the other hand, such as Barats or Fredrin, will usually be on the front line. They are typically able to tank and hold Lord Aggro for some time, but will still be unable to hold it for too long, as the Lord deals true damage based on HP. These types of junglers will be trying to hold Lord Aggro while the team's damage dealers whittle down the Lord's HP. If your team is outnumbered, a jungler with good mobility can try to steal the Lord. This is a high-risk, high-reward maneuver, so retreat if it's clear you're unable to steal it. If you're playing a low-mobility right. hero, do not even try to contest in a disadvantaged situation. You will likely lose the Lord and also die from trying. Do not worry too much if the enemy takes the Lord between the 8th to 12th minute, as it is not yet enhanced and will not have the charge ability that is capable of breaking turrets. You should still be able to defend most of such Lord pushes, after the 12th minute, Lords will be enhanced and will take away a huge chunk of HP from any turreted encounters, so these Lords are incredibly difficult to defend without losing any turrets. This is why at this stage the jungler is incredibly vital to the success of a team. Death timers are also really long in the late phases, so a dead jungler at this point is a free pass for the enemy to secure a Lord. Therefore, it is super important not to take unnecessary risks and die needlessly at this point. The approach yep. to contesting late lords does not change, so apply the same strategies as mentioned earlier. When you're at full items, farming becomes unnecessary and you should only focus on taking buffs. Never trade your life for a buff though, it is never worth it. You can also allow your team's damage dealers to take the orange and purple buffs, especially if they can utilize those buffs more effectively than you. In the late phases, you should be with your team as much as possible, especially if you're playing a hero that is not very mobile. Being alone during the late game is extremely risky, and dying as a jungler at this stage can be punished very heavily. 
This is especially if you're playing a hero with low mobility. Assassins will still be able to split push, but utility junglers should mostly stick with and support the team. Perhaps the most important tip I can give you is to have the jungler's mentality. If you've ever watched or played football before, you'll know that when a goalkeeper makes an error, he can be blasted for that mistake, even if he made 10 wonderful saves before that error. Just like a goalkeeper, the jungler is often roasted by his own team for making even a single error, especially for missing retributions. I want you to remember that, that objectives are not just the jungler's responsibility, but also the team's. So if you do not land the retribution in a messy contest, it is not entirely your blame to take. Of course, if you miss an obvious retribution and allow the enemy to steal it, you should go back to practicing. Because the jungler has so many responsibilities, it is also much easier to make errors. Teammates will roast you for not going to their lane to gank or blame you for them dying. My advice to you for this is stay strong and ignore them. Every second that you spend typing retorts is time that you could have spent watching the map, farming, or rotating. The best way to shut them up is to play your best, farm up, and find your way back into the game. My last tip is for beginners who want to start playing jungle. The best way to learn and practice is not in actual ranked mode, but in AI training. I have tried hard mode, and honestly, the AI is really solid. Use this mode to practice your heroes, get used to jungle patterns, and keep applying the tips I have mentioned throughout this guide. You will eventually improve if you put in the time and effort to do it. Jungle can be really complex, but I hope with this guide it's more clear on what needs to be done when you play this incredibly difficult role. Don't worry if you struggle in the beginning. Keep practicing and make sure you keep your mentality strong. This is actually a really well put together jungle guide. I mean, I didn't really learn anything that I didn't know already. Because this is like, it's it's like... It's basic. It's kind of basic and, you know, medium. It's, it's not not necessarily the highest level, but it is a lot of great information in here because it you can't really, it, it would be hard to make a guide on the highest level of actually jungling because it's just so many variables you have to consider. So that's what really jungling becomes, especially the higher in the elos you get, is the decisions, the the patterns, the, the, the rotations you do. The Yeah, there's basically them, them little small decisions that happens per game and that's constantly changing. It depends on what heroes you got, what items the enemies have, what heroes they got. Like all of that plays a factor into how you jungle. So yeah, it, it really does get complicated. But this was a great guide um, for for starting off. So yeah, let me know what you all think. Be sure to drop that thumbs up, subscribe, and turn notifications. And I catch you all in the next one. Peace out, fam.